But now let me turn to the thought of an analytic philosopher, Willard Van Orman Klein, who taught for many years at Harvard, was the most in, one of the most influential uh, figures of the 20th century within analytic philosophy, and whose ideas actually have a lot of similarity to this. <laughs> there you see a Willard Van Orman Klein action doll with philosophical powers and the web of belief. Okay, and here are some of the books he's written. Those are just ones I happen to have in my office that I can easily photograph for you. Now, Klein is a sort of relativist and a sort of skeptic. He's even a skeptic about the most basic questions. You might say the most basic question of philosophy is really just the question, what is there? Okay, it defines an area of philosophy known as metaphysics, which, by the way, has nothing to do with magic and, and pyramids and all that stuff you find in a bookstore under the heading of metaphysics. It just means, what is there in the world? Well, everything, Klein says famously, but there's room for disagreement over cases. But in the end, he says, look, there is no fact of the matter of all that there is in the world. We'd like to think that in the end, we can tell a story about what really is at that basic level, and that we can give an account of what really exists in the world, but he says there's no way to do it. Actually, we can't even say what somebody believes there is, let alone what there really is in the world. Now, one way of looking at this is to say the postmodernist says language, a conceptual framework, is really just a system of differences. We can articulate a structure, but not what it's the structure of. And Klein says that's exactly right. We can't explain what, in the end, we actually think is in the world. What language is ultimately about, what we're really referring to, that's radically indeterminate. We just, there just is no fact of the matter about what we're really referring to or what we even believe the ultimate constituents of the world to be. In the end, there are really just differences we can note about the world, we can note structure. We can't talk about what the things in the structure really ultimately are. So, he imagines a jungle linguist. This actually used to be part of the requirements for any PhD in linguistics. You had to go to a, a remote part of the world and actually write down a grammar and uh, a dictionary for a language that had never before been studied in this way. So he's imagining that you're doing this. You're out in the jungle studying this language that is radically different from our existing languages, and you're translating this remote language for the first time. Well, you're following a native around, and the native at one point says, Gaga. And you start noticing that when the native says, Gaga, rabbits are around. And so how should you translate Gaga? Well, Quine says it's actually more arbitrary than it seems. Why? Well, here's the situation, right? You see, the guy sees a rabbit, he says, Gaga. -ga. And you start thinking, oh, huh, this must mean rabbit. But actually, it's more complicated than that. There are many things it might mean. So, for example, it might mean, oh, a rabbit. It might mean there's a rabbit. It might be a noun, just rabbit. It could be, ah, oh, there we have a rabbit. <laughs> it could be, oh. Rabbit hood, again. <laughs> it could be a verb. It could be, it's rabbit. <laughs> or rabbit -a. Um Yeah, there it is, rabbit -a, right now. <laughs> I, isn't that Darwin? I just, <laughs> for these slides, I just Googled cute buddy. <laughs> and that was like the cutest buddy I could find. But here's his point. We're really reading our own conceptual scheme into the native language when we translate Gavagai into something like rabbit. Maybe we translate it as rabbit, but there are all these other possibilities. It could be that the natives are not talking about rabbits, but temporal stages of a rabbit. Because whenever there's a rabbit present, there are also these temporal stages of a rabbit. There are also undetached rabbit parts. There's also rabbit hood exemplified there. So actually, all of these are possible. Gavagai might mean rabbit. Maybe it's plural, right? It's what are more rabbits? <laughs> Maybe it means temporal stages of a rabbit. Roy showed you my you know, horse galloping to see if all of the four legs were off the ground at the same time. I adapted that. The Gavagai in motion. <laughs> well, we could be just referring to temporal stages of a rabbit, which in this case is not doing anything. Or undetached rabbit parts. <laughs> or rabbit hood. That's supposed to be a spooky platonic uh, ideal. <laughs> well, anyway. Which should we really think the native is talking about? Is the native talking about the detached rabbit parts, or rabbit stages, or rabbit hood, or a rabbit, or events of rabbiting? 
In the end, Quine says, it doesn't make any difference that the linguists will turn bilingual eventually and come to think as the natives do, whatever that means. For the arbitrariness of reading our objectifications into the heathen speech reflects not so much the inscrutability of the heathen mind as that there is nothing to screw. In other words, there is no fact of the matter about what the native is actually talking about. What does the native really mean? Is this a metaphysics of events, of rabbiting events, of temporal stages of objects, like a hop, temporal stage of a rabbit, of parts instead of holes, unattached rabbit parts? There is no fact of the matter. There's nothing there to try to figure out. All of those are possibilities. Unattached rabbit parts, stages, rabbit hood, rabbits. We have nowhere way to tell. Now, Klein draws a radical conclusion from that, a sort of anti-multiculturalist, anti-Ortega conclusion. There is a notion that our provincial ways of positing objects and conceiving nature may be best appreciated for what they are by standing off and seeing them against a cosmopolitan background of alien cultures. But the notion comes to nothing, for there is no Cousteau. There is no place to stand. He has in mind here Archimedes saying, give me a place to stand and I can move the earth. And he's saying, yeah, but there is no place to stand. So similarly, give me a place to stand outside my own culture, and I can evaluate all these other cultures and see things from a variety of perspectives. But he's saying, there is no way to step outside your own conceptual framework, your own culture. You're going to just read it into everything else. So in the end, can we really find out even what the native believes in, what the native thinks is there? No, there's no objectivity to this. We can't say that. All we can do is translate it more or less arbitrarily into our own conceptual scheme. There's just no fact of the matter about which translation is right. But now here's the most radical thought. That's true even for us. Relativity begins at home. I'd like to say I believe in rabbits. Not rabbit stages or rabbit hood or rabbit parts or events of gravity. But how do I know? I could translate my own speech into any of those other things too. And I have no way of knowing what even I believe in. <laughs> he says there's nothing for me to be right or wrong about. In saying this, of course I philosophize from the vantage point of my own pro pro provincial conceptual scheme. But I know no better. And so in the end, I don't even know what I believe the world consists in. I don't know what even I am talking about. 